Good morning. You having a good, uh, good Monday? Glad to finally see some rain here. Although we didn't get much overnight. They were predicting, what, half an inch overnight? Let's see, what did we get? Actually, no, we did get about, wait, what does it say? No, we got, we got five tenths of an inch last night. If I'm reading that right. I'm looking at my little weather. I have a little like rain gauge back over there. Five tenths of an inch. Not even, not even point one. Wait, wait. No, wait, sorry. I was looking at the wrong one. By the way, yeah, we got 0 0.04 inches of rain. It's like, like I said, not even, not even a tenth of an inch of rain. How about you? Everything good where you are? Well, we're on to the next uh, chapter, and this is gonna be on discrete probability. We're gonna spend, I think, about a week on this. So this session and the one on Wednesday. And then we'll be moving on to new stuff. So we're about, this is what, week 10? 16 weeks total. We got a total of 15 weeks of actual instruction. So this is week 10. And then, um, so then we got 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. We got five more weeks after this one. So I think the next topic after this is graphs. And then uh, following that, finite state machines. Let's we'll spend about a week and a half on graphs, I think. And then the remainder of the time on finite state machines and programming languages compilers uh, and then that'll fill up the rest of the time well actually um let me think about this maybe about a week and a half on finite state machines and graphs and so forth so that's a total of three weeks and then we got about a week and a half where i don't really have specific things scheduled and that'll be some time where we can talk about extra stuff Well, why don't we get started on this new material? So I have here uh, some questions for you to answer. The questions here is, um, you got a street with five intersections on it. So you're driving you know, this way on the street and you're going to encounter some traffic lights along the way. There's five traffic lights. And let's assume now, for now, that all those traffic lights are independent of each other, and let's also assume that they are just red and green. There's no yellow. You're not gonna worry about yellow in these calculations at all. <clears throat> and finally, you've got an equal likelihood of hitting either a red light or a green light. So you approach this intersection, it's gonna be red or green, you approach this one, it's going to be red or green. This one, red or green, and so forth, all the way down the line. What's the probability that all five traffic lights will be green? And then, what's the probability that at least four of them are green? And finally, what's the probability that exactly three of them are green all in a row? So let's work on the first problem first. So take a moment to think about that. What's the probability that all five traffic lights are green? That you hit a green here, and then a here, and here, and here, and here. This might be a good week to bring a calculator. 
trying to make this a little bit interactive or use a calculator built into your computer. But uh, try to calculate this. And, and what we're looking for is either a fraction. Uh, at this point, we're looking for either a fraction or you can calculate it using a decimal number. That's fine. All right, Lord Melbury has it correct with one half to the fifth power. So let me write out how you would solve that problem by showing you some of the work. So we've got the probability of five greens in a row. I'm going to kind of represent that using this here. So a green followed by a green followed by a green, a green and a green. Well, that can be worked out by calculating the probability of getting a green light five times. And I'm using here <clears throat> the letter P to stand for probability. Um, in some textbooks, we'll use PR to stand for probability, maybe in order to distinguish it from permutations. But that's just like twice as much writing for me. So I'm just going to use P. Okay, so it's a probability of getting a green five times. And since the probability of getting a green is one half, we've got one half to the fifth power. What's the probability of getting at least four greens in a row? Oh, sorry, not, not in a row, just at least four greens. You know, so there could be a green here, 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 and here, or maybe uh, four greens over here, or maybe the two here and two here, <clears throat> right? What's the probability of getting uh, at least four green lights? Can you work this one out? Again, a calculator might help. In fact, I'm going to get out my calculator in case I need it. The one I reached for is my Hewlett Packard 50G calculator. So at least four greens. So here's where we could actually leverage some of the combinations and permutations concepts that we learned last time. What we need to do is figure out what are all the different ways that we could get four greens. So one of them would be uh, four greens and then a red. So we've got a green and a green and a green and a green and a red. Or, remember plus is kind of like or, the probability of getting three greens, a red, and then a green. Or the probability of getting two greens, a red, and then two greens. So you can see how the red is kind of marching down the line. And then there's one more possibility, which is all five of them are green. Remember, the question was to get at least four greens. And so having all five of the greens is uh, one of the possibilities as well. Well, the probability of getting four greens and then a red is one half to the fifth, because the greens and the reds are equally likely. So this is 1 over 32. The next one is 1 over 32. 1 over 32. And then we've got a total of 5 of those. 
And then finally we have this sixth possibility of having all five of them being green. So it's 6 out of 32, or 3 sixteenths. Okay, and then the last one here is, what's the probability of getting exactly three greens in a row? What do you think about that one? Exactly three greens in a row. So it might help to work out what are all the different ways to get three greens in a row, and then figure out the probability of each one. What do you think? Three greens in a row. I think I saw an answer appear in the chat and then it got withdrawn. So what was it? Take a guess. Three out of 32 is correct, Max. Good. Let's see how we got that. So let's, let's start by writing down all the different ways to get three greens in a row. So we could have three greens up front and then two reds behind. We've got um, what do we got here? Oh, we got a, a red followed by gr three greens followed by a red. And then we've got the probability of two reds followed by three greens. <clears throat> so there's only three ways to get three greens all in a row. So to work this out, it's going to be the probability of the first one, which we know is 1 over 32. The probability of the second one, which is also 1 over 32. And the third one, which is 1 over 32 as well. And uh, we're going to put a plus between each one of these because it's or. It's either going to be the first situation or it's going to be the second situation or it's going to be the third situation. So this is called independent probability because the, um, the probability of the traffic lights being either red or green are independent of each other. The, the first traffic light does not affect the second traffic light. So you can work out all of these probabilities separately and then combine them together. The first three problems had to do with the probabilities of red or green being equal, but now let's shake things up a little bit and let's change the probabilities. So let's say the probability of getting a red light is 0 0.6, not 0 0.5 anymore, now it's 0 0.6, which means the probability of getting a green light is 0 0.4, because the traffic light is either red or green. So question number four, what's the probability of getting all green? So that's basically question number one again, but with these new probabilities. So all green means the probability of getting five greens in a row. Each one of those greens is 0.4. And we'll raise that to the fifth power. And we get 0 0.01024. So just slightly over a 1% chance 
of hitting all five green lights in a row. <clears throat> and then let's do problem number three, but with these new probabilities. What's the probability of getting three greens in a row? So see if you can work that out. As far as laying out the the ways in which it can happen, that's still the same. It's just the numbers we're going to use are going to be a little bit different. So let me lay that out here. Probability of getting three greens in a row means green, 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 red, red, plus probability of red, green, 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 then red, plus probability of red, red, green, green, green. Plug in the numbers and let's see what you get. Is it 0 0.4 to the third? Um, no. Is it two fifths to the third times three? I don't think that's it either. Let's see how to work this out. So the probability of three greens followed by two reds is 0 0.4 times 0 0.4. So that's our green followed by a green, followed by another green, followed by a red, followed by a red, okay? So 0.4 times 0.4 times 0.4, that gets our three greens in a row, and then we got two reds, 0.6 and 0.6. Okay, and then these other two terms have the same numbers, just in a different order, so they work out to be the same value. That means we can really just do this times three, and that gets us, let's see, 0.4, I gotta work this out here, uh, 0.4 times three, well actually times each other, um, and then 0.6, and then 0.6, gets us 0.023, oh, let me say, <laughs> point zero point zero two three zero four. That's this piece right here. And then times three gets us 0 0.06912. I can drop off the two. I, I, I carry these usually out to like three significant digits and that's fine. Okay, I, I know it's kind of like a little bit tricky to get your heads around this, these calculations, but um, you know, once you do kind of get used to plugging in these numbers and figuring out combinations and permutations, and then from there you can figure out probabilities, it's going to get more. It's going to get easier as we do more and more of these problems. Okay, so this traffic light example was based on the premise that each one of the traffic lights are independent of each other. 
that as you're driving down the street, whether one of them is red or green has no effect on whether the next one is red or green. But, well, at least here in the United States, oftentimes if you have several traffic lights in a row, they've been programmed so that they are, in fact, um, uh, dependent on each other that whether one of them is green actually has an influence on whether the next one is green. The idea being that if you can keep traffic flowing down the street, you don't get as many bottlenecks at each intersection. <clears throat> so let's change this thing up here and say that the probability of the first light being green is 0.4, and the probability of the second light being green, given that the first light was green, is 0.75. So if you encounter a green light on the first intersection, the probability of encountering another green light on the second intersection is now 0.75. It's much greater than half. And the probability of encountering the second light being red, given that the first light was red, that's what this vertical bar here means. So overloading, it's meaning yet again. You can think of the vertical bar means given. So the probability of the second light being red, given that the first light was red, is 0.9. Yikes, that's terrible, right? So if you encounter a red light on the first light, then the probability of encountering a red light on the second light is 0.9. So the first question to ask is, if the first light was green with a 0.4 probability, what's the probability that the first light was red? Well, if the first light was not green, it must have been red. So there's a 0.6 probability that it's going to be red. So what we want to calculate is, what's the probability of encountering a red on the second light, given that you got a green on the first light? So you encounter a green on the first light, what's the probability of encountering a red on the second light? Well, we can um, figure this out. Well, we might be able to do something like uh, guess and check, but we can be a little more systematic about it by writing out uh, what I call a decision tree. This circle here represents the first light, and that first light can be either uh, green or it can be red. There is a 0.4 probability that it's green and a 0.6 probability that it's red. And then you encounter the second light. So no matter which branch you go down, either the green branch or the red branch, you still encounter that second light. And that second light itself can be either red or green. And according to our chart here, if the second light, uh, if the first light was green, the probability of the second light being green is 0.75. And that's represented by this branch right here. Uh, we've got a green followed by another green. And then we also stated that if the first light was red, the probability of encountering a red on the second light is 0.9. And that's this branch down here. So we've got a red light followed by another red light. Okay, so we've filled out most of this tree. We can put in the other numbers as well. There's two more numbers to do. This one here and this one here. Okay, so on the second light, if the light was... So, uh, <laughs> let me say that again. On the second light, the light is either green or red. It's a, there's a 0.75 chance of it being green, so there must be a 0.25 chance of it being red. Both of these numbers need to add up to 1. 
there's a 100% probability that it's either red or green. And then down here, if the light is not red, it must be green, and there's a 0.1 probability of it being green. So now we've filled out all six numbers. And now we can calculate these prob other probabilities. So what's the probability of light 2 being red given that light 1 is green? Okay, so if light 1 was green, the probability that light 2 is red is 0.25. Actually, we worked that out in the tree as well. So we already have that information, 0 0.25. And the probability of light 2 being green given that light 1 was red is this other number that we just filled out, 0 0.1. Okay, now a really good question. What's the overall probability that light 2 is green? What's the overall probability that light 2 is green? So look at that picture and see if you can figure that out. And I'll give you a hint. The answer is not 0.85, which you would get by adding these two together. It's not that. What's the overall probability that light 2 is green? All right, you got 0.4 times 0.75. That is... Um, well, it, it's not the right answer, but it's on the way to the right answer. So as you're going through this tree, there's two ways to get to light two being green. You can either go this branch, or you can go this branch. So either you've got a green green or you've got a red green. There's two ways to get to a green light on the second, on the second uh, traffic light. So that's the probability of getting two greens or the probability of getting a red followed by a green. So let's work out these two terms separately. The probability of getting two greens in a row is 0.4 times 0.75. So we did this first green and we did the second green. And then there's the other possibility, getting a red followed by a green. That's going to be 0.6 times 0.1. And then we add those together because we either get the first scenario or we get the second scenario. So let me work that out here on my calculator. So we've got 0.4 and 0.75 multiplied. And then we got 0.6 and 0.1 multiplied. And then we add those together and we get 0.36. Okay, so this decision tree is immensely helpful for solving these types of conditional probability problems. Because we see how the second light is affected by the first traffic light. So what's the probability of light 2 being red? There's two ways to figure this out. probability of light 2 being red? I'm looking back in the chat now. Sir, he got the answer right. I didn't notice that one at first, so he got the uh, calculation of light 2 being green. You got that correct? 
So we'll try again for light 2 being red. And I can think of two ways to solve this. Oh, good, good. 0.4 times 0.25 plus 0.6 times 0.9. So that's calculated by working out all the different ways of getting to the red light. Probability of a red, uh, is that what you're doing first? No, a green followed by a red, plus the probability of a red followed by a red. Okay, we got 0.4 times 0.25 plus 0.6 times uh, 0.9. And uh, let's see, what do we get for that number there? 0 0.4, 0 0.25, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, And we get 0.64. Okay. And then the other way to figure out that problem is to realize that, well, if, if light 2 um, is red, it means that it was not green. So all we have to do is kind of figure out the complement of it being green. So the probability of it being green is 0.36. So the probability of it being red must be 1 minus 0.36. So two ways to figure out that problem. All right, so now let's take this to the next step. Remember we had five intersections. We've worked out the probabilities for the first two intersections. Now let's work out the probabilities for the third intersection. So I'm gonna say for simplicity that let's assume light three behaves similarly to light 2. That is, um, its conditional probability is based upon the, the previous light. I want to know, what's the probability that light 3 is green? I would start by doing one of these decision trees again. But now we've got three traffic lights. We've got the first traffic light, and then the second traffic light, and then the third traffic light. So there's going to be eight possible ways to make your way through this tree. OK? So, so we could write out that entire tree, but we've already calculated all the probabilities for light two, so we could actually just start the tree right there. So rather than a big complicated one with eight branches, let's just start our tree at light two, and then go to light three from there. So light two is either green or red, The probability of light 2 being green is 0 0.36, and for it being red is 0 0.64. We already worked those numbers out. And then for light 3, we'll use 0 0.75 and 0 0.1 for the greens, and 0 0.25 and 0 0.9 for the reds. So for the green, uh, for the for light three, the same numbers on the right hand side as the other tree had. So the probability of light three being green, again we've got two ways of getting a green light.
So we got 0 0.36 times 0 0.75 plus 0 0.64 times 0 0.1. You see these two paths through the tree. And if you multiply in that out and add in the numbers, you get 0 0.337. Okay, trying to get the idea. So when you're working out these probabilities, uh, one thing that has probably been kind of obvious, but it uh, bears repeating here, is that the probability, uh, to, oh, take into account all the possible outcomes for a particular event happening, uh, must add up to 1. For example, if I have a coin, and it's an unfair coin, with a 0.55 probability of coming up heads, what's the probability that it comes up tails? And I have, if I have an unfair fair coin that actually has a chance of landing on its side, with a 0.55 probability of heads and a 0.43 probability of tails, what's the probability it ends up on its side? And then uh, if the weather is either sunny or cloudy or rainy, and there's a 0.5 probability of it being sunny and a 0.3 probability of it being cloudy, what's the probability of it being rainy? Okay, so for the, uh, for the coin, it's 0 0.45 because these numbers need to add up to 1. For the unfair coin with, a, with landing on its side, it's 0 0.02. All these need to add up to 1. And then for the weather, this is 0 0.2 because all those need to add up to 1. So in general, if uh, some event A has a 0.3 probability of happening, what's the probability that event A didn't happen? So this here, this is my little symbol that means not. So the probability of A happening is 0.3. What's the probability that A didn't happen? That would be 0.7 needs to add up to 1. All right, so I've got here a standard deck of cards, um, and if we give them a good shuffle, which I haven't done yet, I just opened up this pack of cards, so let me go ahead and shuffle them. Oh, it's shuffling uh, brand new cards is kind of difficult because they're not flexible yet, but I'll do my best. Um, so if I give these a good shuffle, and I pick and I pick uh, and I pick out three cards at random without replacement, so I don't put the cards back after I pick them out. What's the probability of picking a clubs followed by a head, uh, uh, hearts followed by a diamonds? So if I've got my cards here, oops, you can't see them, right? What's the probability of picking out a club followed by a heart followed by a diamond? So, um, Maybe if you're not familiar with these types of cards, there's a total of 52 cards in this deck. They are um, split up into suits. There's four suits. We've got clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. So there's a total of four suits. And then within each suit, there's 13 cards from ace, which you can think of as being like one. And then there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
And then there's three what are called the face cards. And those are jack, queens, and kings. So there's a total of 13 cards in each suit. 13 times 4 gives us a total of 52 cards in a standard deck. And so what I want to know is, what's the probability if I just randomly pick out three cards? What's the probability of getting a clubs followed by a hearts followed by a diamonds? Oh, once again, Serhei has got it. So the way to figure this out is you figure out what's the probability of getting a clubs. So I start with 52 cards, and I pull one of them out at random. There's a one, oh, not, not a one, actually he doesn't, <laughs> I see his answer there, but it's not, not quite correct, but he's on the right, right track. So what's the probability of picking out a club? You got 52 cards to pick from, what's the probability of picking out a club? So we're going to pick out a club, and then we're going to pick out a heart, and then we're going to pick out a diamond. So the probability of getting a club is 13 out of 52. There are 13 cards in here that are of the club suit, and there's 52 cards. Now, the probability of picking out a heart is not 13 out of 52. It's now 13 out of 51, because I pulled one of the cards out. Now there's 51 cards remaining. And then the probability of picking out a diamond, what is that? That would be 13 out of 50 because, whoops, I can see I made a mistake here. This is 51. Okay, so 13 out of 52 because there are 52 cards to start with. Then the next one for the hearts is 13 out of 51 because there's only 51 cards remaining. And then finally for the diamonds, you've got 13 out of 50 because there's only 50 cards remaining. So we can work that out. We've got uh, 13 over 52. This is 0.25. And then we've got 13 over 51. And this is um, some fraction. <laughs> uh, 0.2549. And then 13 over 50. Point two six, and then if we multiply those all together, we get zero point zero one six five six. How about what's the probability of getting three clubs in a row? So you pull out a card as a club. You pull out a card, it's another club, you pull out a third card, and it's also a club. So that would be the probability of getting a club, and the probability of getting another club, and the probability of getting another club. All right, that's good. So you got 13 out of 52. And then you get another club. <clears throat> there, not only are there uh, only 51 cards remaining, but there's only 12 clubs remaining. So that number goes down as well. And then for the third card, it's 11 out of 50, because you've pulled out two clubs and you've also pulled out two cards. Let's see, 13 times 12 
times 11 is 1716, and on the bottom it's 5251501313. I don't know why I did it this way. Uh, but we end up with like a what point a zero zero one two nine. Oh, no, I don't think it's quite that, that. Uh, 0, 0.0. The problem is my calculator, my calculator gave, gave this to me in scientific notation, so I need to translate that into decimal. I think it's that. Okay, so when you're doing these problems where you're pulling, pulling stuff out of a deck of cards or you're pulling like, um, I don't know, you know, toys out of a bin or something like that, remember that as you pull things out, the numbers are changing because the quantity of items left over is diminishing as you go. Okay, so let me put this all kind of in perspective here. The reason why or what we're doing here is, at, by the end of next time, I want to give you an idea about how spam filters work. You, you know, you're all familiar with spam filters. They're what protects your inbox, right, from being flooded with all sorts of advertisements and uh, emails that you don't want. And so these spam filters need to be able to pick out which messages are spam and which ones are, and I kid you not, the, the actual uh, word is ham. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, it, well, where it comes from, right? Spam is actually a um, canned ham product that you can get here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, somewhere along the lines, it got, and because it's not like the greatest food in the world, I mean, it's okay. Um, it's, it's, it's actually short for spiced ham. It's basically ham that's been chopped up and then I probably, I don't know, dehydrated and then reconstituted and then stuffed into a can with some spices. And then um, I actually have a can of it downstairs. And normally I would bring it like to the live stream and show it, but I forgot to bring it up here today. Um, so spam is the bad stuff and ham is the good stuff. So literally people who work on these spam filtering products uh, professionally call it spam and ham. And so... <laughs> So these spam filters need to look at an email message and determine whether it's spam or ham and then uh, put it into the correct box. Put it either into your inbox or put it into your junk mailbox. So here's three pieces of an email address. Um, just take a look at them and would you classify them as either spam or ham? So this first one starts out, Dear Sir, first I must solicit your confidence into the transaction. This by virtue of its nature as being utterly confidential and top secret. What, yeah, and it goes on from there. Um, uh, would you classify that as being spam or ham? Is it, is it junk mail or is it good? What do you think? And, and n not only what do you think, but what kind of gives it away as being one or the other? Like what do you see in that message? that would classify it as either spam or ham. I mean, if, if this was my mailbox, I'd probably classify that, f that first one as spam. But what about that message gives it away? What kinds of words do you see there? Now, here, here's what spam filters have a difficult time doing. Spam filters can't really, I mean, they're, they're not, um, they're just computer programs, right? So it's very difficult for them to infer some kind of meaning out of the messages. So, you know, words like it's vague or it's specific or it's, it's um, you know, it's not like good grammar don't, are, are very difficult for a computer to figure out. 
So a spam filter is more likely to just look at individual words. And so I might see things like confidential and secret and solicit. And maybe the fact that at least in most email messages that you're writing maybe to a friend or a relative, you don't typically, you know, address it as dear sir. That's more like for a business transaction. And if you're just sending emails to a friend or a relative, you don't usually start out emails that way. So you've got, you know, words like, like those. What about the second message? What are some real kind of like objective things that you could look at in that message to say that is either spam or it's ham? How would you classify it? So Sir Hay says, this is spam. But what do you see in the message that gives it away? All caps, yeah, so all caps. That's a giveaway, right? What else? Maybe stuff like 99 million email addresses. Or, you know, put remove in the subject. Future mailings. Right? Those are not typically words or phrases that you know, you use an ordinary email message. And what about the third one? Spam or ham? Now, I'm, I realize that this, this may be somewhat debatable, but how do you think a, a spam filter would classify this? So Surrey says it's probably ham, right? Because this is more like the way someone would actually write an email message. Like, okay, I know this is blatantly off topic, but I'm beginning to go insane. Had an old Dell Dimension XPS sitting in the corner, decided to put it to use. No, it was working um, pre being stuck in the corner, but when I plugged it in, hit the power, nothing happened. Right? You know, there's nothing really in there that gives it away as being a spam message. That's so probably ham. Okay, so that's the context by which we're learning this pro discrete probability. We're going to learn a little bit about how spam filters, modern spam filters work. Now, I, I can tell you a little story here. Back in the 1990s, I worked at an internet service provider, one of the very first ones in this area. <clears throat> Back then, uh, internet service providers were usually little operations, not the big giant corporations that they are now, but they were very often family-owned businesses with a few hundred customers. And, and literally all you had to do was go out and buy a bank full of modems, the old dial-up modems, but back in, the 90, back in the 90s, that's the way we got internet. We used the old, you know, dial-up modems that made those screeching noises. So you bought a whole bank of a few dozen of those. You bought a couple of computers to act as servers for email. Uh, web servers, and then, uh, you know, you went into business. And so I was hired as one of the system administrators in charge of running these computer systems. And um, so while I was working there, that's when we started getting this influx of spam messages. Before then, spam really wasn't a thing. In the early internet, people sent emails to each other, and there was this no concept that you would use it for nefarious business purposes. So spam really became, started becoming a problem while I was working for a few years at this internet service provider. And so um, being a relatively new phenomenon, we as system administrators had to figure out how to combat this because, you know, we didn't want spam in our mailboxes and neither did anyone else. So uh, the first spam filters were kind of homegrown, home, uh, you know, it, it writ, basically written by me. It was basically a program that the, the message would come into the mail server, it would run through this program, and then it would just apply a whole bunch of pattern matching to it. I would just look for specific words or specific phrases based upon my own investigation of what a spam message looked like. So I would my, myself receive spam messages in my mailbox because I would look at them 
and would go like, what kinds of phrases do spammers use in their, in their messages that would give them away? And I found things like, you know, email, you know, 99 million email addresses. That was actually a very common spam message back, back then was this company selling email addresses for like, you know, $100. You could buy 99 million email addresses. So phrases like that. Um, uh, back then, using HTML in an email message was pretty rare. So having a, an email message that had styling in it with, with like bold and, and colored text, that was pretty rare. And so actually it turned out one of the most common colors that was used in an email message by a spammer was white. Right? And the purpose there was to make some of the text be invisible so that the viewer of the email message couldn't see that text, but it contained um, you know, uh, some of the the, um, what am I trying to say? It, it, it contains some of the text that the spam, spammer wanted to get across. Um, and so I wrote all these filters that would look for those particular phrases. And then it became what we call a cat and mouse game, where as, the, as my filters got more sophisticated, the spam messages got more sophisticated. And in fact, system administrators started sharing their spam filter files amongst each other. Like every day, um, sysadmins would upload the latest set of pattern matchings to a central server, and then other sysadmins would come and download those files and then plug them into their spam filters. And so the spammers also had access to this, of course, and so they would run their messages through the filters and see which ones got through and which ones got caught. And if they got through, they would then, um, or if, they, if, if the messages got caught, they would then adjust something about their messages that would make them not get caught. Like they would change some of the spellings of some of the words. So they would deliberately misspell some words. Or instead of using like white as the color, they would use like almost white. So instead of hashtag FFFFFF for white, they would use maybe hashtag FFFFFE, right? And that was enough to get it past the spam filters. Um, so it became this, this game where every morning we would download the latest set of patterns and then um, by the next morning, that list uh, had grown, right? Because the spammers were trying to figure out new ways of getting past the filters. So this filter list got longer and longer and longer to the point where it was taking many, many, at this time, perhaps minutes for a spam filter to check an email message. So by, but it wasn't long before emails got horribly delayed. Like someone could send an email to our server and it wouldn't be deliver, delivered to the recipient's inbox for a couple of hours because it sat in a queue of spam mess, uh, messages that hadn't yet been scanned. And so as the day progressed and the, and the business day progressed, the queue would get longer and longer and longer and the, and the messages would get more and more delayed. And then at nighttime when the businesses you know, stopped sending and receiving so much email, then the queue got shorter and shorter and we kind of got caught up. <clears throat> and it, you know, it got to the point where we actually had to buy a whole separate server just for the purposes of spam filtering, right? It was just crazy game. And so it was about that time when spam filters started getting more sophisticated, right? Um, you couldn't do this where you just were scanning over and over again for patterns in the message. It just took too long. And we needed something that was more like artificial intelligence. Not only could it scan an email message quickly and make a decision quickly, but also it would learn over time what messages were ham and what messages were spam because it, it, it could be taught. So basically any time a user put a message into the correct box, like it, let's say a, a message got through the filter and ended up in their inbox, and then they moved it over to the junk mail box, that would let our system know that, hey, that message actually was spam. We need to adjust the filters so that it works better. Or if a message had appeared in the junk mail box and they moved it over to their inbox, then that would also let us know that we got it wrong and we need to adjust the filters. And let me let you know that, that pattern matching alone was not like the sole arbiter over whether a message was spam or not. Initially it was when I kind of wrote my own spam filter I would just basically add up the number of patterns that got caught. And if the number went over a certain threshold, then I marked the message as spam. And if it was under that threshold, 
then it got marked as ham. You know, but I would have to keep changing those numbers as the number of patterns went up. And also some patterns were more spammy than other patterns were. Some of them were a dead giveaway for a message, and some of them were kind of like, well, if you see that, it might be spam, but you know, that could also be a phrase that someone just might use in their messages. So I'd give those particular patterns a lower weight. So some patterns had a high weight, and some had a low weight. And then I would just add up all those weights, and again, if it went over some threshold, I would mark it as spam, and if it was under that threshold, it'd be marked as ham and go into the inbox. But occasionally, I would get things wrong. So we needed two things. We needed spam filters that were faster, and we need spam filters that could adapt themselves to uh, new spamming techniques that the, the spammers were using. Okay, so that's kind of the backstory, my own personal story about dealing with spam. And these days, I, I don't run my own mail servers anymore. I leave that up to you know Google and Yahoo. I just have accounts there. They're better at it than I am. <clears throat> and besides, they have uh, one big advantage, I mean, other than more processing power these days, but they have one big advantage is that they have a huge user base. So they're able to look at a huge number of messages and, cl and classify them as either spam or ham and get corrections from the users. Whenever you move a message from your junk mail folder to your inbox or from your inbox to your junk mail folder, the system is learning from that behavior about whether that message was actually spam or ham and correcting itself. Okay, so you may know about something called Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule allows you to calculate a probability if you know something else about those probabilities. And, you know, and this is another story here. Bayes' rule has been around for, like, I don't know, 150 years or something like that. And... Uh, and so statisticians and mathematicians knew about it, but where it, it really like kind of got uh, leverage into an industry that hadn't really thought about it was in medical diagnostics. See, up to about maybe 30, 40 years ago, if you went to a doctor's office or a hospital with some kind of condition, the doctor would like, you know, take a note of your symptoms and then make an educated guess about what was going on. And then from there, would devise a treatment plan for you. But it was really just based upon the doctor's educated guess or hunch or intuition about what might be going on with you. And it wasn't until doctors and hospitals and statisticians started really collecting evidence about whether or not those guesses about your diagno diagnosis were correct, started learning to see that we could actually collect statistics about medical conditions and then not just make guesses about what's going on, but actually make really good, informed, educated guesses about what's going on based upon probabilities. And so, like I said, up to about 30 or 40 years ago, doctors just had a hunch or an intuition about what your condition was. But now, they've all been trained in doing probability, in particular Bayes' rule, so that they can make um, diagno diagnoses based upon evidence, not based upon a guess. And so, Bayes' rule, I think, is really important to learn, not only because it, it gets used in spam filtering, but also because it gets used every day now in uh, industries like medical diagnostics. So what Bayes' rule allows you to do is calculate the probability of a cause given the evidence. Like, for example, I might have a disease that causes some test to either come back positive or negative. Right, and I'm drawing this diagram here with this arrow showing the order of the condition, right? So this disease here happened first, and then the test happens later. So we can say that the outcome of the test is conditional upon whether or not you have that particular disease. And so, um, you know, for the most part, the disease is not observable. 
know, because it's inside your body. And the only way to actually see the disease is that we actually opened you up, right? Um, but this is the cause. But the outcome of the test is observable. And we say this is the evidence. Okay, and so we want to know what's the probability of having the disease given the outcome of the test. So if the outcome of the test is positive, what's the probability you actually have that disease? And if the outcome is negative, what's the probability you don't have that disease? So we can plug these variables, D and T, into this formula that uses A and B. And what you get is the probability of T given D times the probability of D over the probability of T. Okay, so and one thing that I that I myself have picked up over the years is that what this Bayes rule basically allows you to do is if you want to calculate, you know, like say A given B, but you know B given A, what, what Bayes rule allows you to do is basically flip the order of those conditions around. So if you know the conditions in one order and you want to calculate them in the other order, then Bayes rule allows you to do that. Okay, so let's put Bayes rule uh, into practice. So let's say um, you, want, uh, you want to apply Bayes rule to some kind of test for uh, a given cancer. And I just made up these numbers here. These aren't necessarily real numbers, but they're maybe, they're sort of realistic numbers. So let's say in the overall population, there's a 0 0.01 probability of having that cancer. So we can say that, you know, out of 100 people, one person has this cancer. And how would we determine that? Well, you know, like, you know, at some point, we'll, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll die of whatever reason. And then we do an autopsy on them. And it turns out in 1% of the cases, people actually had this cancer. And then we've got a test for this cancer, like a biopsy of some sort or some kind of blood test. And um, so if you have the cancer, the probability that test will come out positive is 0.9. And I'm using plus here to mean a positive test and negative to mean a negative test. So the probability of having a positive test, given that you have the cancer, is 0.9. And the probability of having a negative test, if you don't have the cancer, is 0.8. Okay, so if you are a manufacturer of some kind of medical test, then you will publish these statistics. You know, the, um, the test will come with like this instruction sheet that says, here's the probability of the test being positive if you do have the disease, and here's the probability of the test being negative if you don't have the disease. Okay, so we want to work out, oh, oh, well, let me back up and say, let's say a patient comes to the hospital, you know, you're not feeling too well. Maybe it's you, right? You're not feeling too well. And so the doctor thinks, well, I guess there's a probability you have this cancer. Let's run a test. So the test comes back positive. What's the probability that you have that cancer? Right? So you ran the test, comes out positive. What's the probability that you actually have that cancer? So to be able to calculate this, we need Bayes' rule. So we'll, we'll, turn, we'll plug these numbers into Bayes' rule. We get the probability of a plus given cancer times the probability of cancer over the probability of having a positive test. Okay, so we look at this formula, and we have this number right here. It's 0.9. We have this number. It's 0.1. But we don't have this number. We don't have the overall probability of a positive test. So to calculate that, we'll need that decision tree. So 
So the cause is the cancer, and you either have it or you don't have it. And then that's followed by the test, and that either comes up positive or it comes up negative. And then we can put in some of those numbers. The probability of having cancer is 0 0.01, and the probability of not having it is 0 0.99, right? So both these numbers have to add up to 1. You either have it or you don't have it. The probability of a positive test, given that you have cancer, is this number right here. And the probability that uh, a negative test, given you don't have cancer, is this one down here. So you'll notice in these decision trees that there's going to be a total of six numbers. And whenever I give you one of these problems, usually I'll just give you three of them, and then it's up to you to calculate the other three. And you can calculate those other three by just simply taking, you know, the complement. So notice that we were, uh, we were given the 0 0.01 of having the cancer, and we can calculate the not cancer by just subtracting it from one. So the probability of having not cancer is 0 0.99. The probability of a negative test, given that you have cancer, is 0 0.1. So this row here needs to add up to 1. This row needs to add up to 1. And this row is also going to need to add up to 1, and that is this last number that we haven't put into the tree yet. That's the probability of a positive test, given that you don't have cancer, 0 0.2. So there's six numbers altogether. I'll usually give you three of them. You calculate the other three. You won't necessarily need all six numbers, but it's good to have them. Okay, now we can... Now we can calculate this. Okay, so for the numerator, we got 0 0.9 times 0 0.01. Okay, so we got the probability of a positive test getting cancer, so we got that number. And the probability of having cancer is 0 0.01, so we've got that number. And then for the denominator, we need to figure out what's the probability of having a positive test. And there are two ways to get a positive test. Either you can go through the tree this way, or you can go through it this way. Okay, both of them end you up with a positive test. So this is 0 0.01 times 0 0.9. That's this top branch. Plus... 0 0.99 times 0 .0, uh, uh, 0.2, and that's this kind of zigzaggy branch. Okay, the numerator, easy to calculate, 0 0.009, and the denominator, now I've got to use my calculator, that it's a 0 0.01.9 and then 0.99 and 0.2 and then we add those together and we get 0 0.207 and then if we actually do the division we're going to get 0 0.043. All right, so let's say this was you. So, you know, let's say you went to the doctor's office, you weren't feeling too well, they run this test, it comes back positive, and um, so, you know, you're a computer scientist, you're a math person, right? You run the numbers yourself. And um, 
comes back and there is a 4% chance that you actually have the cancer. Now, first of all, does that seem high or does that seem low? Like intuitively, do you think that's high or low? Remember, the, the chances of a positive, given you have cancer, is 90%. So usually what you hear in the, you know, the popular media is that this test is 90% accurate. So it comes back positive. Does that mean you have the cancer? Remember, it's 90% accurate. Well, it turns out there's only a 4% chance you actually do have it. And the reason for that is because only 1% of the population actually has the cancer. So even though the test is 90% accurate, the fact that you've got a positive test doesn't mean you have the cancer. In fact, there's a very low likelihood that you do. What's the probability that you don't have the cancer given a positive test? Well, if the probability of having the cancer given a positive test is 0 0.04, then the probability of not having the cancer given the positive test must be 1 minus 0 0.043, which is uh, 0 0.0. 957. So there's about a 96% chance that you don't have the cancer. So just because you have a positive, di uh, positive test result doesn't, in this case, mean that you actually have it. What's the probability? Oh, let, let's say you go into the doctor's office not feeling too well. So they run this test and it comes back negative. What's the probability you don't have the cancer? given a negative test. Let's use Bayes' rule again. Okay, so to calculate the probability of not having cancer given a negative test. Uh, plugging that into Bayes' rule, you get the probability of a negative test given that you don't have cancer times the probability of not having cancer over the probability of a negative test. Okay, so we have this number, probability of negative given not, 0 0.08, uh, not 0 0.08, just 0 0.8. And the probability of not having cancer, we have that number. We calculated that to be 0 0.99. And then the probability of a negative test. So we could use the tree again. The probability of a negative test would be this branch or this branch. Um, but we could shortcut that a little bit by realizing that the probability of having a negative test is just not the probability of having a positive test. And we know what that is. It's... Um, 0 0.2, uh, yeah, 0 0.207. It's this number here. So the probability of the negative test is 1 minus that. So we get 0.792 on the top and 0.793 on the bottom. And then when you divide that, you get 0.999. Woo! So the test came back negative, and now you've got very nearly a 100% chance that you don't have the cancer. So even though, even though the test is only 80% accurate for the negative case, there is almost a 99.9% .9 chance that you don't have the cancer if the test comes back negative. So sometimes these results can seem counterintuitive. And you can see why doctors would now have to be trained on this stuff because 
um, just taking a guess, you know, the test comes back positive, and you go like, well, you probably had cancer. Well, actually, there's a very slim chance that you do. So put yourself in that position. What would you, what would you do if the test came back positive? And you realize there's a 4% chance. Well, I mean, is that, is that low or is that high? What would you do in that case? Or if you're the doctor, if you're the doctor, what would you do? So a test comes back positive, you run the numbers and you realize there's a 4% chance that this patient has cancer. What's your next step? Well, maybe the next step would be, let's run a test again. You know, 4% chance you have cancer, let's run the test again. Maybe the test uh, result was faulty. You know, if we, if we get two positive tests in a row, then that would give us a much higher confidence that you actually do have the cancer. And if you got a negative test, that would probably give us a lower confidence that you have the cancer. So it'd probably run, the, it'd probably run another test. We'll work that out next time. So on Wednesday, we'll work out the probability is if we run the test again, and then we get two positives, how does that change the overall probability that we have this disease? And if we get a negative, how does that change the overall pro probability that we have the disease? And you can see how this, these kinds of calculations are really important, especially over the last couple of years, because we've got this like, you know, disease running rampant through the world's population, and we want to know. If we run a, you know, a test for the coronavirus and it comes back positive, what's the chances you actually have it? And a lot of that hinges on how accurate those tests are. When um, the, you know, the coronavirus was first you know, spreading throughout the world two years ago, there were these tests you could get. <clears throat> this was before the actual like tests for the coronavirus itself. You get what we call these um, antibody tests that would test to see if you already had the antibodies to it. And this would let you know whether you've already had the coronavirus or not. Um, and some of those tests that came out early on were just notoriously not very accurate. That it came back positive and that didn't give you a whole lot of information about whether you had the, 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 the coronavirus or not. So if we get a chance, maybe next time, we'll take a look at some of those data sheets that you can get from the manufacturers and see, you know, if, the, if I had taken one of those, if you had taken one of those tests and it came back positive, what's the chances that you actually had been sick with the coronavirus? So this is really useful stuff for evaluating, um, you know, some of these test results that maybe you've, you've taken some of these tests over the past couple of years and being able to evaluate whether or not it's giving you good information. So I'm going to do one more problem based on Bayes' rule here. And, you know, the numbers that I made up about the, those cancer things were just, like I said, just made up numbers. Um, but then I dug around a little bit and I found an actual research paper written by a doctor uh, with the intent of teaching other doctors about Bayes' rule. And in the, the paper were some actual case studies. So I pulled one of those out and I was really just like thrilled to find like actual real numbers, not these made up numbers, uh, you know, for cancer. This is actual real numbers. So the case study was the patient comes to a doctor's office and has a chronic cough and an occasional spout of, of breathlessness so they can't catch their breath. So a biopsy is performed on the patient, <clears throat> but this biopsy either indicates that they have lung cancer, which is, of course, not a good thing to have, or a benign thing called sarcoidosis. So the biopsy um, doesn't tell you which one you have, just that you have one or the other of these things. Okay, so either you're totally normal, 
you don't have any condition and you're just, you know, you just have a cough and, you know, you're occasionally breathless, um, or you have lung cancer or you have sarcoidosis. And then we've got this test that either comes back positive or negative. Again, based upon an analysis of the overall population, we know that uh, the probability that you don't have either of these two conditions is 0.991. The probability of having lung cancer is 0.001. And the probability of having sarcoidosis is 0 0.008. Okay? And the probability of the biopsy coming back positive, given that you don't have anything going on, is 0 0.002. The probability of having a positive biopsy given that you have lung cancer is 0.9, and the probability of a positive test given that you have sarcoidosis is 0.95. And so what we want to know is if the, prob if the test comes back positive, what's the probability of lung cancer? And if the test comes back positive, what's the probability that you have sarcoidosis? Oh, by the way, you know, the treatment for lung cancer is, of course, you know, highly invasive and not really that great, and the prognosis isn't too good if you have it. And the, the, di the treatment for sarcoidosis is a round of antibiotics. So definitely, if I could pick the two of them, I would pick the latter. <laughs> okay, so we want to know, what's the probability of lung cancer given a positive biopsy? So Bayes' rule, plug it in the Bayes' rule, we have the probability of a positive biopsy given you have lung cancer times the probability of cancer over the probability of a positive biopsy. So to figure out uh, the top, well, we have some of those numbers. I'm going to need some space here, so I'm going to put it on the next line. So we have some of these numbers. The probability of a positive, given that you have lung cancer, is 0 0.9. The probability of having it is 0 0.001. Got that right here. And then the probability of a positive test is where we need that decision tree. So let's write that out. Okay, so you have, you know, some kind of disease here, and it's either going to be uh, normal or cancer or sarcoidosis, and we've got numbers for that. We've got 0 0.991 and 0 0.001 and 0 0.008. Actually, I'll write that out here. Okay? And then you got this test. And that's going to come back either positive or negative. I like this particular example because it's an example of a more complex tree. Okay, probability of a uh, positive given normal is 0 0.002. Probability of positive given cancer is 0 0.9. And the probability of positive given S, sarcoidosis, is 0.95. And then we can figure out those other numbers. This one here is 0 0.998. This one is 0 0.1. And this one is 0 0.05. Okay, so the probability of a positive test, this branch, this branch, or this branch. So there's three possible ways to get a positive test. 0 0.991 times 0 0.002. That's this branch right here. Plus, oh, I need to make this line longer. Um, 0 0.001 times 0 0.9. Plus 0 0.008 
times uh, 0 0.95. <laughs> so that's that's the three branches through this tree. And just in the interest of time, I've already worked out these numbers, but you go ahead and multiply and add, and then you get actually I gotta I'm gonna move this up out of the way so I got space to do this calculation. Here we go. Um, okay, so the top is 0 0.0009 and the bottom is if you could multiply and add together you get 0 0.010482 and then if you actually do the division you get 0 0.0859 so uh, biopsy comes back positive and there is almost a nine percent chance that you have lung cancer which seems pretty high, like, you know, one out of 10 chance. But let's work out the other possibilities here, which is this one. So this one, again, we plug it into Bayes' rule. We get a probability of a plus given S times the probability of S over the probability of plus. So we have all those numbers. This is going to be a quick calculation. Probability of plus given S is 0 0.95. Probability of S is 0 0.008. And the probability of plus, we've already worked that out. 0 0.010482. That came right over here. And we get 0 0.0076 over... 0 0.010482 and this comes out to 0 0.725 okay so patient walks into the hospital or doctor doctor runs this biopsy biopsy comes up positive there is a 0 0.09 probability that they have lung cancer and a 0 0.72 probability that they have sarcoidosis. What's the treatment plan? So I guess if I was a doctor in this situation, what I would do is, first of all, I would not schedule the patient for invasive lung cancer <laughs> surgery. Uh, what I would do is probably give them a round of antibiotics and say, come back in two weeks and let me know how you feel, or we'll run the biopsy again, right? <laughs> Um, so round of antibiotics, because there's a, you know, almost three quarters chance that they have something that can be treated by antibiotics. So give them a round of antibiotics, come back in two weeks, let's run the test again and see if that cleared it up. If it cleared it up, good. You had sarcoidosis, go home. Um, if the test still comes back up positive, you know, then we can work out other probabilities to say like, well, we, we ran a test, we gave them a round of antibiotics, that did not clear up the problem. So now what's the probability of lung cancer given that you don't have sarcoidosis, right? We're not gonna work out those calculations uh, right uh, today or uh, probably ever, um, but that's something to think about is, you know, given, given that the test comes out positive and given that we don't have sarcoidosis, what's the probability now that you have lung cancer? You can work out those probabilities. Again, it's all just Bayes' rule and drawing some diagrams and figuring out the probabilities, and you could do it. And the doctor would probably do this as well. So that's, that's probably what the treatment plan in this case would be. At least if, you know, if, if I was in that situation. Okay, so that was an introduction to conditional probability and Bayes' rule. We'll come back on Wednesday, and we'll see how to apply that to things like running the test twice, or running the test three times, you know, and see what happens. And then that will lead us into being able to figure out how to calculate whether a given email message is spam or ham based upon the kinds of words that you see inside the message. So if you see, uh, give me a little preview here, if you see this particular mix of words, what's the probability that message is spam and what's the probability that it's ham? 
And then from that, you can make a determination about whether it should go into their inbox or into their junk mail box. All right, so I know that was a lot of like math and calculations, but really the math is no more complicated than addition and multiplication. I think the really important thing there is to realize, to, you know, to draw that decision tree and, you know, go through the actual process. You've watched me for an hour and a half do these calculations, rewatch the video, and then every time I, you know, pose one of the problems, pause the video and actually work the calculations out yourself. Don't just watch me do it. And again, I'll have to tell you about personal experiences. Uh, I think it was probably about, I'm guessing it was about 10 years ago. I took one of the, one of the very first MOOCs, M-O-O-C, which stands for Massively Online Open Courses. And one of the very first ones that was ever offered was a course from Stanford University on artificial intelligence. And so I took that course, it didn't cost anything, I just worked through the material, and then at the end I got a, yay, you, you completed the material, right? Um, but that's where I learned this stuff about Bayes' rule and conditional probability, because it gets used a lot in artificial intelligence. I mean, spam filtering itself is an example of a very kind of like primitive kind of artificial intelligence in which it's, it's learning about what's spam and what's ham. You know, also robots that roam around have to make decisions like, you know, given uh, an obstacle in the way or given that a sensor is reading, like, you know, something's in the way, what's the probability that something's actually there and has to be steered around, right? It's all, it's all conditional probability. Uh, also for self-driving cars, right? You know, the sensor's picking up an obstruction in front of the car. What's the probability that it's a pedestrian? What's the probability that it's a fire hydrant? What's the probability that it's another car? Right, so the, the, uh, the self-driving car or computer is like calculating all these probabilities all the time to try to figure out what course of action to take. So I took this course in artificial intelligence and this Bayes rule stuff made up probably the first half of the course. And you know, I'll have to say, I went through the first week of the course and I thought I had all this stuff, right? You know, I, I watched the videos and, um, you know, see, like this is really obvious stuff. And so when it came time to take the test based upon the first half of the course, I completely bombed it. I mean, like I got almost every problem incorrect. And it was a really humbling experience to get like almost a zero on the test because I was just looking at it from like, oh, you know, the answer is just intuitively correct, right? You just multiply these two things together and you've got it. Or you just add them together and you've got it. And so, Based upon that, I went back and I rewatched all the videos from the first week. And this time, I worked out all the problems as I went as they went along. Even though they gave us the answers, right? I actually paused the video and worked out the problems myself. And as a result of that, I was able to get a much higher score. I passed that test. At first. I still made some mistakes, right? But I passed the test based upon having gone back and actually worked out the problems myself. Even though they gave us the answers. Take the time to actually do the problems, and then you'll get used to how to actually set up the problem, plug the numbers in, and arrive at the correct answer. Um, the question is, is our CAPTCHAs machine learning? Um, sort of. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of an example of artificial intelligence, but the whole idea behind a CAPTCHA at least the ones where you have to, um, you know, identify the pictures now, like identify the pictures with fire hydrants or identify the pictures with uh, bushes in them. Uh, those are kind of by definition images that the computer doesn't know what's in them and you're actually helping to tag images. You know, when you do an image search on Google and you say, you know, show me pictures of fire hydrants, uh, the reason why it gets the search results that it does is because people like you have been solving CAPTCHAs and have been helping to decode what's in these pictures. So it's showing you pictures that the computer doesn't know the answer to, and you're helping it to identify uh, where like the fire hydrants are. Actually, so the answer is, usually I've noticed it shows you nine pictures, and then the actual thing that you're looking for is in like three or four of them. And so the way it works is in, I think probably two of the images, it knows that there's, let's say, fire hydrants in it, and it's in one of the images where it doesn't know. 
And what you're doing is you are helping to tag that photo as having a fire hydrant in it because the computer hasn't been able to figure it out. The same thing with the, you know, before they were doing images, uh, previously that they were doing like these uh, words out of what looked like scanned books. And that's in fact what it was, was they were um, scanning old books in. And because the ink can be smeared or the pages could have deteriorated, the text was not readable by the computer. So the computer had a really low confidence about what those words were. So you hand it off to a human and you ask the human, what are these words? And if several people agree on what that word is, then we go, okay, we, we now know that that word is the word and, or that word is the word aardvark, right? Because we weren't able to tell before, but now several people have written in and told us what that word is. So when you were doing some of those captchas from, this was probably like five years ago or so, with these uh, words that were kind of smeared, then that you were actually helping computers uh, translate uh, text, the, the, the scan text into actually, you know, actual text that you can see on the screen. So captures aren't technically machine learning. Uh, they're by definition not machine learning because remember the whole idea of a captcha is to present a problem to a human that only a human can solve but a computer can't solve. And so captures are showing you problems that the computer has not been able to solve and you're helping it out. Um, now, now that's, that's not to say that the reason why they stopped doing text was twofold. One was they just ran out of text to do. And the other was the spammers, the people who were using CAPTCHAs to get past things like email address, uh, email account creation and, uh, you know, downloading programs. The reason why they were able to, to subvert the CAPTCHAs was their programs to do optical character recognition were getting better and better and better. So even though the text that was being presented to you was not, you know, highly identifiable, at least now OCR was good enough that it could just type in the text and then present to the CAPTCHA and they get past it. So I guess in that case, it sort of is artificial intelligence and machine learning because the spammers were now getting tools that were good enough to decode that text quickly and be able to set up, you know, thousands of email addresses. The story behind CAPTCHAs is really kind of interesting. Um, if you get a chance, maybe find a podcast or a YouTube video, especially if it includes an interview with the original CAPTCHA creator, who's, ah, whose name I, I, I'm drawing a blank on at the moment. Let me see if I can find something. Oh, here we go. His name is Louis Von Ahn. L-U-I-S-V-O-N-A-H-N. And so if you can find a, a video or a, um, you know, a podcast with an interview with him, it's kind of interesting because he tells you about the whole process of creating this thing and, you know, the fact that it's, that's sort of the antithesis to machine learning. Luis Van Ahn may seem like a slacker. He loves watching television. I, watch I can't show you too much of this. That's how I spend um, most of my YouTube time outside of work. I blank out my video because this is a, you know, an actual TV. Like, right copyright now, I'm video. Right now, Heroes, but, Dexter, uh, Fringe, Weeds. I've been watching Weeds as well. When he's not anyway, watching so, TV, Luis is playing games. Here's the I video I'm watching. I play some games like Nintendo DS or the Wii uh, and some computer games. Luis is the kind of person who gets a game and anyway, he wants to be. Anyway, for that. Oh, uh, let's see. I remember a TED Talk where they shared the idea of CAPTCHA was helping two business models. First, the CAPTCHA challenge, and the other ones needed to help OCR systems to improve its algorithms. Yeah. Yep. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So there was a, yeah, a TED Talk which uh, Louis Van Ahn was in. So that may be also another thing to look for. Oh, maybe this is it here. <laughs> Massive scale online collaboration, a TED Talk with Luis Van Ahn in it. That was the very next video on the list. So that'll be the one to watch also. That one's about 
15 minutes long. And I definitely can't show that to you because YouTube will definitely find that and go, cut the stream. No more of that. I, I did that one time on a YouTube stream. I showed a TED video and they went, nope, none of that. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, so uh, I think that's about it for today. Again, we'll come back on Wednesday and we'll learn about spam filtering and um, how to do a Bayes rule but apply it to multiple variables instead of just two variables. Okay. Well, I'm glad you could all make it here. And I'm glad that you got a chance to try out some of the problems and solve them. Again, once the video comes out, go back, watch the video, pause after the problems are introduced, work out the, the math yourself, and then see if you are right. That will help a lot in understanding this material. Hope you all have a good day. Take care of yourselves. And I will see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. All right, and then folks on YouTube, thanks again. It's good to see some of you. Actually, it's good to see all of you. It's good to see some of you again, that you're checking in every, every week and you're watching these. So you can see this material is totally different from what I was talking about, what, just uh, two weeks ago? So no more um, cryptography, no more hashing and stuff like that. Now it's all going to be oriented towards um, probability, graphs, finite state machines, learn about compilers and programming languages, just completely different stuff. Oh, you're welcome, Lord Melbury, Lord Melbury, who's thanking me for today's lesson. Um, totally, like I said, totally different. Some people really get a kick out of it because you're learning about something you kind of take for granted every day, spam filtering. Um, but some people go like, oh, it's math, right? But really, it's, it's not more complicated than multiplication and addition. All right. Um, with that, I think we'll end the stream here. And again, I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Or if it's in the middle of the night for you, go get some sleep. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. <laughs>